You're listening to What in the World with Richard Gardner on Canada Talks, Sirius XM 167. Well, if there was ever an evening where the title of this particular show, What in the World, was more appropriate, it would be this evening. Uh, joining us tonight is somebody that I think, you know, epitomizes what this this show is all about. I mean, we're certainly a show that would talk about, you know, again, the fascinating, the unexplained, and the underexplained, but truth. Try to, trying to, to, to certainly get past the, uh, the uh, you know, the curtain that has been put in front of what we, I think, might all agree is is not the real world but you know i'm not sitting here today suggesting i have the answers but in my short lifetime of uh, 45 years on this planet one of the things we have seen is a convergence of science and and spirituality for lack of a better word and for a long time these two were you know at loggerheads and one sort of disproved the other but the more quantum physics uh, has evolved and the more people like Nassim Harriman continue to do the work they're doing, the further down the rabbit hole we're going. And what we're finding is that if you, if you start to look back at ancient civilizations and some of the things that they seem to be talking about and writing about and knowing, whether it be in scriptures or otherwise, but also as we're starting to look at phenomenon that's you know in our cosmos and in our universe the micro and the macro the closer you seem to be getting to something of a unified field and that's obviously a daunting task because a lot of people with names like einstein have gone down that road and haven't had enough time on this planet to ultimately get there uh, and, and find that elusive unified field but our guest tonight is somebody that certainly uh, has done, uh, again, yeoman's work in this particular field and has, and has introduced the world to some very exciting, very innovative perspectives on a unified field theory. So let's welcome Nassim Harriman to the show. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be with the Canucks once again. I, you know what? I didn't know that about you until today doing research for the show because, uh, you know, again, I've, I've been following your work for, for a few years and certainly watching your presentations on YouTube and, and reading a lot, of, a, a lot of the papers you've written. But I only found out today that you grew up in eastern Canada. I did. Uh, I hold a Canadian passport and I spent most of my childhood in Canada. Absolutely. And now, uh, as probably anybody that spent a lot of time in their childhood in Canada, you figured out, you know what, if I'm going to set up a place for the foundation, it's not going to be in Canada. Let's think Hawaii. And exactly. you end up in paradise, essentially. But talk a little bit about the foundation, the evolution of your work, and ultimately being where you are, because I know that th that isn't just a random choice. It all sort of was part of an integrated approach to doing the work you're doing at the optimum level that you need to do it. Right. Uh, absolutely. I, I think that when you're doing the type of work I'm doing, you need to really consider the environment that you're in. And, you know, for me, uh, nature has been an inspiration my whole life. Obviously, Canada is incredible um, natural sites all over the place. Um, and I was very, very drawn to nature from early on. And for me, it was not just wanting to be in nature, but as well wanting to understand nature and, and understand how it works. When I looked at nature, I could see that it seemed to have very specific pattern of evolution, very specific, you know, interaction with each other and all this. And it, it seemed to have a very highly coherent behavior. And I wanted to know where that behavior came from. And so I've always seek in my life to stay in beautiful, natural uh, environments um, from eastern Canada to uh, the Rocky Mountains in Banff and Alberta and eventually Whistler, um, BC and and then beautiful places all over the U.S. as well and all around the world. Um, I was uh, and then eventually Hawaii, where I founded and established a, the research foundation that's called the Resonance Project. Does it worry you as an, as an aside before we get into you know the detailed part of your work? Because as you were talking there, I was envisioning 
you know, myself. Uh, and certainly, uh, you know, I did not end up going in the same direction as you did, because I think I, I think, uh, you know, the I was lacking the necessary brain cells, perhaps to go to the depths that you can go. But what I did have was a curiosity and, and, and that that idea of looking up at the stars as cliche as that sounds, it, it was a part of growing up that I remember, you know, you know, lying around with friends, let's say, you know, it's a late summer night and you're looking up and you're asking, you know, what do you think's out there? And and you get all these interesting theories, you know, depending on, you know, what people are smoking, perhaps. But, you know, you get you get I remember specifically often hearing this, you know, what if the what if the earth is actually like an atom inside a person? And, you know, of course, it was kind of funny and ludicrous at the time. Well, the more I've I've gone down the rabbit hole myself, uh, Nassim, the more I look at this micro and macro relationship as probably something not that necessarily, but it seems to be that there is a relationship that we're we're just beginning to uncover. But before we go into that, how how much does it worry you that the kids today who are and I don't like making generalizations, but if you have your face in a in a in a video game or or a, or a laptop or whatever from the time you're very young, how many more Nassim Harriman's are we going to see if they're not out in nature being inspired the way you were? Yeah, I think it's it's a critical issue um, nowadays. Um, you know, people are getting more and more separated from nature, and. You know, obtaining a good balance between the two, between the technological world, between even the city life, if you live in the city, and getting out there in nature, enjoying it, maybe doing sports or, or even just contemplating, um, you know, I think it's really crucial. And that's why I founded the, uh, the Residence Project Foundation in a beautiful, lush environment where I could bring scientists that would collaborate with each other and, and be in an environment that's inspiring, where they could, you know, feel connected to nature as, you know, all of the physics we're describing and attempting to resolve have to do with the natural world and how it works. So, so being inside under neon light, you know, on your computer may not be conducive to having, you know, very creative thoughts about how nature may function. And um, so having a good balance between the two is critical, and especially for the developing mind, you know, especially for the children. And so, you know, I encourage parents to uh, bring their children in nature and get them to experience nature in various ways, whether it's uh, doing a sport or it's um, just uh, sitting at sunset and, and looking at um, sunset over the water or over the mountains or wherever you are. So, yeah, it's kind of critical. Mm, you mentioned water, and that's a good segue into some of your, you know, I think more fascinating and innovative theories uh, that, you know, for you, perhaps even the seed of consciousness might exist in water. And for a lot of people, again, water is just a liquid, whatever you drink, they don't necessarily have the understanding of what it looks like when you freeze it or when you break it down or when you look at the properties. But that's that to me is something that I find is unique to, to Nassim Ehrman when I think about your sort of observation in that. Can you expand a little bit on, on, on that insight into, you know, what water might be in terms of the ultimate solution? Right. Well, you know, definitely there's a common denominator to the biological world. Um, one is that it has highly structured um, dynamics, but, but another is that it all emerged from water. Uh, all biological life emerged from water. And so at the one point, you got to come down to that common denominator if you're trying to find the source of the structure that you're seeing all around you and say, okay, what's in water or what is water that it's able to do this? Mm. And that's, that's one way that I came about it. I mean, I came from, at it from very different angles, from, you know, advanced physics to ancient civilization and so on. But certainly, you know, water becomes a very central piece of understanding how information is moving through the structure of space-time in order to eventually generate highly coherent, highly
highly self-organizing system like the biological world we see around us, and then eventually that biological structure becoming self-aware, which is a whole other thing, you know? And that self-awareness, I think, is probably something that's going to uh, be a big part of Humanity 2.0 when we, when, we be, when we get past the illusion of separateness and understand that everything's living, that everything is alive, and, and literally not just the ecosystem, but the planet itself, that the cosmos itself, everything is a living organism. We're going to continue after the break when the Seam Harriman get a little further down the road on some of these theories. And we're, I don't know, I can't promise that we're going to solve all the secrets of the universe, but we're going to try tonight on What in the World, Sirius XM Channel 167. <laughs> Welcome back to What in the World with Richard Garner on Canada Talks, Sirius XM 167. And we are with Nassim Harriman, whose work, in, in my opinion, is, is, is as far as whatever the, we want to call it, the independent movement of science and uh, truth-seeking or however you want to you know, categorize it, you know, we're not going to get there with rhetoric and euphemisms and subjective opinions. There, there's got to be somebody that's blazing the trail, that's actually interpreting the uh, the world around us, the universe around us, and seeing the miracle that is inside of that. Because I, I, I know for your, I know your answer to this, Nassim, but I know for me, one of the things that I would find most ludicrous of any statement. And I don't necessarily want to get into the, you know, atheist argument or or is there a God, because I don't think we need to go there. But the one thing I, I especially with all we know, fractal geometry and, and Fibonacci sequence and everything else, to look at this world around us and say that this all came together randomly is about as, as nuts uh, a, a, an assertion as I can think of. It almost requires a cognitive dissonance, I think, to be able to suggest that this is, you know, this is a bunch of stuff that banged into each other, for, for lack of a better word. And I know for you, it's, it's looking at these building blocks uh, as a young man that started you on this quest that gets you into quantum gravity and, 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 and certainly the vacuum and all of these other things. But from that standpoint, is, is that a fair assertion that there's, there's some perfection in this world that's undeniable? You know, it's not just um, rhetoric to think that there is a problem with the random universe approach to things. Uh, it's straight-up mathematics. It just doesn't add up. Mm -hmm. um, if you try to run the probabilities of uh, things coming together in such a coherent manner, even to produce all the microbial life and the structure of one blade of grass, uh, after 14 billion years since the Big Bang, or 13.8 uh, billion years since the Big Bang, it doesn't add up. You just don't have enough time. Uh, the complexity is way too high, and the probabilities of that occurring are close to zero. Um, and so the idea that you'd have complex, interacting biological structures, such as the environment we see all around us, and then never mind the complexity of a one human being that has enough DNA to go around the world five million times, you know, uh, in them, completely functioning in a co coherent matter, you know, uh, incredible speed of division of cells and so on. This is, um, this is very, very complex, very, very advanced. And for me, very early on, I thought, there's got to be some organizing principle at the base of this creative force that, um, that I must understand. 
And the problem is when you start talking that way, typically the assumption is that you're talking about some religious mm -hmm. uh, entity that that's uh, creating everything, and, and that now you're falling into religion and, and dogmas. And there's an alternative to that. And the alternative has to do with the possibility and uh, very much the probability that um, the structure of space-time is information and that the information is able to feed back onto itself just like a fractal structure and create the incredible complexity we see all around us and the fractal nature of all the biological entities we see around us as well. And that... and. and Sounds like you're alluding to the idea that you you know you see perhaps everything is like an atom, everything is a black hole, and uh, conversely a white hole as well. That there's this sort of reciprocation going on, and it it also fills in a gap that I'd never actually contemplated before. But I you know in in uh, watching some of your work, you know the idea that electrons can spin you know uh, in perpetuity for billions of years. Where is the where's the energy source for for that to ha and 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 I mean again this is why you know you need curiosity you need people with different perspectives to come and look at something like that and ask that question because there's been a lot of great big minds that have been studying you know physics and atoms specifically who haven't asked that question and I'm curious when when did that first occur to you and and where has that taken you? Well, you know, it's like. To me, it was uh, just talking on the theological and and philosophical side of things. You know, the 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 current theory of the Big Bang was about as good to me as uh, the religious beliefs uh, that says God created everything. Uh, the Big Bang was just replacing the word God with Big Bang and just saying, well, there was a bang and everything came out of it. And um, but not explaining how the energy got there to produce the bang in the first place, um, and and so saying that the energy was just conserved over time in some frictionless ideal environment just didn't cut it for me. So I, I looked at, for instance, protons that are stable, extremely, extremely stable, um, electrons, uh, galaxies, stars, all this stuff spinning everywhere, and um, I felt like there must be a source for that. There must be a source, and actually, if we're going to do real good physics, we must have, um, you know, a way to uh, agree uh, and complete the uh, conservation laws, which state that energy ha can only be changed from one state to the other, but is always conserved. So... I look for a source of energy. I look for a way to uh, be able to explain how things continuously tend to uh, self-organize, tend to continue to move uh, and to uh, rearrange and create higher and higher level of complexity, which is contrary to the idea that the universe is random, that it's running down, that entropy takes over everything and breaks everything apart. Um, it, there's a lot of evidence all around us that nature actually does something quite different, that it puts things together and creates higher and higher level of coherency. So I look for that part of the equation, the part that would, the, the part of the cycle that would be feeding the energy we see expanding that, that, uh, that seemed to be running down, so that there would be a feedback structure between the part that seems entropic and what I call syntropic, or actually Buckminster call, Fuller calls syntropic, the, the part that feeds the dynamic that we see everywhere. Yeah, and that's, you know, obviously, that's a lot for, for people to take in, and, 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 and it's interesting to me because, you know, that's a whole other conversation as to how we are so scientifically illiterate collectively, and... I don't think that was random either, right? I think the the way things got organized uh, in this particular version of society, it was to make sure that, you know, look, you guys don't worry about all the boring science and history and government, and we'll take care of all that. You guys focus on the football game and, 
and and <laughs> whatever, and don't worry, we'll take care. Of, and so you have these people, unfortunately, smart people, educated people, that with a gun to their head could not understand what you said, and mm-hmm. and and so that presents a real problem of of getting people to see the forest for the trees, as you said earlier, because. There's such an, an inherent lack of foundational base understanding. And one of the things that you talk about a lot, I mean, you talk about just a holistic approach to everything, which seems to be the more we look at it, two plus two equals four. But the way the disciplines of science got all broken up, where the physicist doesn't know what's going on with the biologist and the biologist doesn't know anything about chemistry and you know, this guy doesn't know anything or, or, and this woman doesn't know. So we have all these people working in compartments and when you come to the table with a very holistic approach to everything, it seems that of course you're going to get you're, you're going to get uh, backlash because sure. most of the audience, even the scientists, are only going to understand a portion of what you're bringing to the table. Exactly, it's very problematic it, it, because um, typically scientists work on very specialized problems. They're extremely specialized in their field of expertise. They typically don't talk with other fields of expertise, you know, even within the same uh, field of investigation, you know, like getting astrophysicists to talk to quantum physicists is, is a big issue. Getting even astrophysicists that are working on different problems in astrophysics to work to talk to each other is a big issue. Never mind asking a quantum physicist or a natural physicist to talk to a biologist or to talk to a chemist, uh, and so on. And so you get these very, very um, uh, sparse, uh, discontinuous bits of information that doesn't give you a whole picture, uh, a holistic picture of what actually is going on. And so it's extremely hard to put the piece together. And when you do, typically it kind of flies you know, above the head of most uh, specialized scientists because um, it's too broad and and it's overwhelming and, and it's hard for them to digest. Yeah, and, and, you know, not to mention there's the whole cognitive dissonance and ego that comes into that as well. But it's in, also interesting to me that pretty much anybody that's made a major contribution in science on, in the history of this planet was uh, marginalized, ridiculed, dismissed and or worse and then ultimately after they're dead we figure out well you know it turns out you know copernicus you know had a point there we're going to make a stamp thanks copernicus right. you know like well the thanks you know like i uh, yeah it would have helped at the time before you put me in prison and yet even as we sit here in the in in the 21st century that that hasn't really changed much you come to the table with something that that uh, it challenges the current paradigms and it's yeah. the exact same process, and there's nobody going, wait a sec, guys, you know, remember, we did this before, turned out, you know, we delayed our own evolution by 20 years. And, yeah. and I find that interesting, because we're supposed to be the most sophisticated species out there, yet we're the only species that's actually capable and currently doing uh, the, the craziest thing that I can think of, which is delaying our own evolution because of our lack of an open-minded approach to new ideas. Right, which is actually, you know, contrary to true scientific inquiry. Um, you should be, uh, the, the concept of being skeptic is a good concept. Um, however, being skeptic doesn't mean that you're closed-minded. Being skeptic means that you're open-minded, and that, however, before you make an opinion, you investigate truly uh, the thoughts or the concepts or the mathematics or whatever you're examining before you come to hasty conclusions. Um, but being open-minded and being ready to consider various approaches is kind of critical to scientific discovery and advancement. And yet uh, our educational system and our you know, um, our uh, academic uh, organization do not uh, encourage out-of-the-box thinking. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, the, the systems were embedded in, in order to be able to publish, in order to be able to have advancement in the organizations that we work with, 
uh, in order to be able to get funding and so on. Uh, none of these things are set up to really encourage completely out-of-the-box thinking, you know. If you're advancing something, you know, a detail on this or a detail on that, and this is why scientists become very specialized, then that's okay. But if you all of a sudden say, well, wait a minute, I think that actually black holes are not just absorbing information, they're emitting information, all of a sudden, you know, you you could you could get in a lot of trouble. Never mind if you tell them that the nuclei of at atoms, that the little proton in the center of an atom, is most likely a mini black hole. So you know, um, uh, I'm, however, under consideration, uh, I think that um, somebody that looked at the theories I'm bringing forward and look at where the standard model is. I uh, would find that there is actually not that large of a gap between the two, but just very uh, slight adjustments in the interpretation of various sets of data throughout history would lead to exactly what I wrote. Well, the irony, too, is, you know, the, 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 the period of enlightenment that spawned this great age of science, uh, you know, came about because people that challenged the church were, you know, crucified in, you know, different ways, uh, you know, whether it be the Crusades or the Inquisition or whatever else. And now we have the Church of Science, and if you challenge the dogma of that particular church, well, you may not be, you know, you may not be hanging from the rafters, but they'll certainly find a way to make sure that you're assassinated character-wise in one way or the other. We're going to talk a little bit about that after the break. We're with Nassim Harriman of the Resonance Project. It is What in the World on Sirius XM Channel 167. Here's Richard Gardner with What in the World on Canada Talks, Sirius XM 167. Well, if you want your mind blown, well, I mean, there's, there's a bunch of ways I guess you could do that. But if you're interested in expanding your own universe by furthering your understanding of our universe, I strongly suggest that you go to the website for the Resonance Project, which is, it seems to have been updated, Nassim, uh, from, from when I was checking it out back in the day. And now this is, this is really sharp, like, you know, not just aesthetically in terms of the pictures and everything, but the information. Tell us, what is the Resonance Project? Well, the Resonance Project is a nonprofit foundation that I started, um, you know, some 10 years ago, and that um, was intended on um, uh, setting up an environment uh, for scientists to come together uh, of different fields and bring them together under the same umbrella to study and come up with new ideas on how to solve a unified view of nature, a unified view of physics, a unified view on how the physics create the environment around us and how a consciousness eventually, um, you know, emerged. And whether it, it was there prior or after or, and, and so on. And, and so um, the idea was to create a research part uh, where people could do that. And so now we've been able to uh, start this research part finally with some support, some grants, and we are set up in Kauai on the beautiful Garden Island in Hawaii. And we are on 13 acres. And we have a little bit of a research park here where a bunch of different scientists are exploring these new physics and these new ideas on biology and on consciousness. And this is kind of stemming 
it's all stemming, obviously, from the work that I initiated much earlier on. However, as well, it involves uh, uh, discoveries and, uh, and construction and investigation of technologies that could make a large difference for our planet today. And it sounds like the maybe the beginning of a good movie there too, Nassim. The you know like okay, we're gonna start this this project, but you know who are the you know let's go out the, the you know the Magnificent Seven or you know whatever. Uh, it, who are the maverick scientists who want to come together and be part of? Because you know every great movie has that that hero's journey, right? Where obviously Act Two is about doubt and fear and and a massive obstacle to overcome. But we know how it works out. It works out that ultimately they, they, they find within themselves that they were more than they ever thought, and they're able to, you know, bring the world to another level. What, what was the process in terms of bringing your team together? Well, it's been an a ongoing process for, for a period of time, and since the publishing of my latest paper, which made a very uh, striking and very accurate prediction of a measurement of the radius of the proton that has been problematic in the standard model, um, I, you know, have got much more attention from the international scientific community. So it's been really good in the last few years that we have had many, many incredible scientists come through here and help us out. We have currently on staff uh, astrophysicists, uh, doctors in astrophysics. We have you know, biologists. We have we have people that worked at one of the largest experiments on the planet, the CERN accelerator in Switzerland, that that quit to come and volunteer here at the Residence Project, wow. and so on. So, you know, it's getting really exciting. It's getting really interesting, and it's really, um, you know, uh, looking up in our capacity to like deliver some very important information and some very important technology. What would you, if you got cornered at a cocktail party or in an elevator and somebody said, what's the ultimate objective here? What, what, is, what is the day, let's say, that you could envision closing down the foundation because you've achieved this objective? Uh, well, there's many different levels. One of them being uh, that we have achieved a way to have sustainable production of electricity, and sustainable transport, transportation capabilities. Um, so that's one of the objectives. The other would be that we have a good percentage of the population of the planet that understand that they are part of an incredible, you know, real works of nature, that, that they are they're not isolated, that they're connected to each other, that everything in their uh, body that, that's that's made of protons and, and electrons and so on are all connected, that nature is talking to itself and that they're a representation of that conversation. And, um, and so that their brothers and sisters around them are not, you know, um, to be uh, war against, but to be collaborated with and, and um, you know, and that we have a truly sustainable society. Uh, that will be the day I will close the residence. Well, I look forward to being there for that, and uh, and I mean again, we're a big part of what we're we're doing on this show is talking about what is what does that humanity 2.0 look like, and that isn't going to happen with a new political leader or a new political movement or a new company or a new technological uh, technological development. It's going to come with some sort of consciousness evolution to another level. Uh, beyond, you know, as Einstein said, you know, you're not going to solve the problems of the world with the same level of consciousness that created those problems. A big right. part of the work that you're doing ultimately through, you know, the own, the scientific process and your years, uh, you know, looking into microscopes and telescopes, but you're not alone because many of the, the bigger, f you know, f names in physics over the last 150 years seem to all be coming to a similar conclusion that consciousness might be that unified field. Is that is that something that uh, you would you would say is a, is a fair statement? Yeah, um, I you know two things. One is uh, I totally agree with you that like the consciousness level and awareness of the planet must rise in 
um, in con, um, in parallel with the technological development in order for it to make any sense and to come to pass. And that's why actually the Residence Project Foundation just initiated, and we're going to have our first course in the next few weeks, uh, the Residence Academy, which is like a place that people will be able to come and take online courses about unified physics and learn about it and discuss it with peers and meet people from around the world and so on. But as well, you know, your statement about consciousness, I think is important to understand that when we say that we're all coming back to the place where we're saying, well, it must be, a, the unified field may be consciousness. If we don't define what consciousness means, hmm. we ha- we, you know, we kind of came back to the idea of, a, you know, might as well say it's all God or it's all the Big Bang and so on. And so what is consciousness is kind of critical to identify, not necessarily um, what it is in terms of, um, you know, all its complexity, but what is the basic mechanics in nature that would produce a self-aware uh, entity like a human being. And I think that those mechanics cannot be segregated um, like to the human being only, meaning that, you know, basically if you look at a human being, you've got a sack of water with a bunch of minerals in it. And so you can't just say, well, consciousness started right here or right here, you're going to say, well, this must have been there with the water and the minerals. Somehow, the mechanism must have been there already present, and that's when you start to say, okay, so that mechanism might be a fundamental unifying understanding of the physics of our universe. Yeah, and that's, you know, it, it feels like we're on the cusp of something. And before we take our break, although I guess that's too big of a question to ask before we take a break, but I'll ask you anyways, um, as things seem to be more abstract, uh, especially at the subatomic level, uh, things, uh, you know, duality and polarities start to fall apart and, and things are up and down at the same time and black and white at the same time. It, it, is it possible uh, that we might be the creator and the created? Uh, absolutely. Uh, you know, the, there's absolutely, from the physics that I've been able to ascertain, which, you know, now are extremely precise, um, you know, is more sloppy in the earlier years, uh, and are able to make very, very precise, uh, you know, prediction on the way the universe works. Um, I, from those physics, I can absolutely assert that there is a continuous feedback of information between everything and everything else. And so everything is definitely the creator and the created. Everything is talking to everything, and this is why it can self-organize. This is why it can become very, very, very complex very rapidly. And, and since it has this kind of feedback, um, then self-awareness is kind of a fundamental feature of its, of its evolution. And, and it's not some other thing that we call consciousness, but it's actually a fundamental mechanic that's present all along the evolution of any, you know, material universe, if you'd like to call it that way. Mind blown. Um, <laughs> we are going to take our last break with Nassim Harriman. Coming back on the other side, we're going to, hear a little more about the, the exciting work that they're doing at the Residence Project and, and ask the big question, uh, where did it all start? It is What in the World on Sirius XM Channel 167. The dreams in which I'm dying are the best I've ever had. I find it hard to tell you. I find it hard to take. Time keeps on slipping, slipping, slipping. You're listening to What in the World with Richard Gardner on Canada Talks, Sirius XM 167. And only a little bit of time left with Nassim Harriman, but we'd be remiss if we didn't ask uh, him about time, time and space, which, again, for the uh, 
For the uh, non-initiated, you can hear people say, oh, that time and space doesn't exist. It's just a product of this particular dimension or whatever. But, you know, you, you could say that to me 10 different ways. Very, very, very difficult to get our heads around that idea. But mm-hmm. with that, obviously, the, 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 the prospect of time travel been discussed, been looked at, been scientifically diagnosed uh, from, mm-hmm. again, all the big names out there. But you seem to feel that that is something that not only is is possible, but it's probable. Absolutely. Actually, it's not precluded from precluded from, from Einstein's field equation, even in the standard model. Um, you know, say time travel is maybe possible, but um, uh, more importantly is uh, what exactly is time and how is time related to evolution of a, a universe and, and, and how is Space related to all that, and I think that you know I, 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 I like in a very very large view, in a very like high level view. If I keep it simplistic, um, you could say that um, in a very direct way that that time um, would not exist if there wasn't memory. And that might be kind of shocking to someone, but think about it. Um, if you can't remember anything, you wouldn't have a concept of linear time or mm-hmm. linear evolution. So if time is memory, then time is information. Um, and if uh, so already we're kind of going down the rabbit hole. And um, it, it, it's really important there to to get that like um if 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 the universe has time that is if the universe has a very specific linear evolution like the one we see of the biological structure around us getting more and more complex and so on then there must be memory in space Hmm. meaning space must be holding information about what's happened before (laughs) um and that may be what we call memory. Actually, memory may not be located in the brain, but maybe the brain is in uh, connected to a memory bank that's very specific to a very specific path in space. The interesting. I, mean? the, I was just going to say the interesting thing about that too is that it 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 kind of uh, triggers thoughts of things like the Akashic field and things that would have been talked about you know, centuries ago by ancient civilizations. And I guess the, 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 the question has to be then, how did they know or, or how did these so-called primitive civilizations understand these concepts, at least in, 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 in some way? And where did we, uh, where did we drop the ball? <laughs> well, well, yes, uh, very true. The many of these ancient civilizations um, around the world that supposedly had no contact with each other talked about this primary field as this field of information, this Akashic record of all information, um, and, and that this field of, uh, of uh, information was, was, is at the base of creation. It's, it's in most of the ancient civilization uh, creation myths. And, and it has to do, um, and, and how did they get there? How did they, well, consider this. If we, if we are truly baiting in a field of information, and, and we know in quantum theory that it's there, and we, you know, we have now been able to measure it. It's called the Casimir effect. It's a dynamical Casimir effect now where we're extracting literally photons out of that field. Uh, but, but, um, assuming that we're being in this field of information and it is the source of the material world, since we're in it, uh, you would think it would come out in our cultures. You would think it would come out in our philosophies, in our, you know, history, that we could look back in the history and you, we could find evidence of people kind of getting it, that that's how things work. Uh, and really, that's what initially... Uh, made me thought that it would be a good thing to uh, study ancient civilization to see if there was a coherent story uh, and, and like that would correlate across the whole world, across cultures that supposedly weren't in contact with each other. And I found that. 
I found incredible correlations between many different cultures, all talking about that field and actually talking about the geometry of the field, the dynamics of the field, how it works, how you can influence it, and so on. And then, as well, something even more esoteric emerged as I studied the ancient civilization. And that is, for some people, probably pretty hard to swallow, but I'm just going to say it anyway. All these ancient civilizations, or at least most of them, don't claim to have come up with that there themselves. Mm-hmm. They, claim, they claim that they were visited by advanced beings that came from the stars, that they call sun gods in many, many cases, and uh, that these sun gods give them all the knowledge, the writing, the mathematics, the engineering to build buildings that we couldn't build today with all of our technology, and so on. And so that brings us to subjects that, are, that can well, be much more controversial. And, and ultimately, a perfect setup for our second show, when we have you back, because that's exactly what I, where I want to begin the next time we talk, because that's it's two plus two equals four. It's completely obvious, and obviously we're not going to ever be able to go forward until we know the truth about our past. But what we do know more today than when we started about an hour ago is that this universe, this this self-organizing, beautiful miracle that is in us, that is around us, that we are, like you said, bathing in in terms of that information, is alive, it's well it's prospering and it's evolving, and that means we're going with it regardless of what you may see or what you may think. And I think history will look back at the work of Nassim Harriman and the Resonance Project the same way it looked back at a lot of physicists who initially were dismissed but ultimately were vindicated. So, Nassim, thank you for joining us tonight, and I look forward to bringing you back here on What in the World. Thank you so much for having me, Richard. And yes, the truth will prevail. Giddy up. That is Nassim Harriman. And uh, again, we could go on for probably a few hours, but we'll save that for another time and bring him back uh, even closer to the end of the year. This is What in the World, Sirius XM Channel 167.